October 16, 1972. At 9 a.m., a 1959 Cessna 310C operated by Pan Alaska Airways with tail block letters N1812H departed from Anchorage International Airport en route to Juneau, Alaska. The plane never arrived. Now this might just seem like a rare occurrence as thousands of planes have done this flight before but no issues. But the difference between this flight and the others, this flight's passengers were two United States congressmen. Gone. Without a trace. On today's episode of Unblurring the Unknown, the disappearance of Hale Boggs and Nick Begich. Welcome back to Unblurring the Unknown. I'm your host, Dominic, and today is a very interesting topic, and it's a topic I've known about for a little while, and it kind of motivated me to do it this week. Obviously, I want to keep it fresh and interesting every week for you guys, and it kind of brought me to this. I, is, I have yet to cover a strange disappearance of any sort, so that's why it led me down the rabbit hole of this particular case. Now... Like I said, this topic has captured my interest for a long time, and often a lot of these unexplained disappearances get thrown right on front page news, and it's often a game-changing event in world history and in aviation history, much like the disappearance of Malaysian Airlines Flight MH370. I think everybody has heard of that disappearance, and that plane has still not been found. However, this one has perplexed investigators for 50 years, with no evidence to show for it, and which much of common America doesn't even know this event happened in the first place, which I think is very interesting to this story. And again, it motivated me to cover it. Now, let's get into the root of this story. Now, obviously, as I covered in the intro, at 9 a.m., a 1959 Cessna 310C, which was operated by Pan Alaskan Airways, departed Anchorage en route to Juneau. It was carrying Congressman Hale Boggs and Congressman Nick Begich. Now, the evening before this plane took off, it did a routine maintenance flight in preparation for the next morning's flight. So it did a light 100-mile flight to Fairbanks and back to make sure everything was checked and ready to go specifically for the purpose of the passengers it would have the following day. That makes sense, right? Now, two of the U.S. Pa- of the of these passengers were U.S. congressmen, like I said, Hale Boggs being from Louisiana, and then Nick Begich being from Alaska. Now, Begich was Alaska's only representative in Congress, and Boggs was up in Alaska helping Begich campaign for his reelection. Begich was a freshman in Congress, and he was in a tight race with Republican challenger Don Young. A little tidbit I also found interesting: this. This would be the same Don Young, who would later become the longest-serving Republican in Congress after he served 49 years, which is very interesting, and he passed away either this, uh, this year or, or last year, which I, I felt like was kind of interesting when I was doing this research. So, Hale Boggs, from Louisiana, most notably served on the Warren Commission, which if you don't know what the Warren Commission is, the Warren Commission investigated the 1963 assassination of John F. Kennedy. Now, this is important, so kind of... Put this in the back of your mind because I will come back to the Warren Commission at a later part in this story. Now, the other two passengers on this airplane were Russell Brown, who was a political aide to Nick Begich, and the pilot Don Johns. Now, Don Johns was not only the pilot of this 1958 Cessna, but also was the owner of Pan Alaskan Airways. He reportedly told his friends before the flight that he was providing it free of charge because of the passengers he had the pleasure of serving. Obviously, he knew that he was transporting two United States congressmen, so he felt like that was important, so he was going to offer the flight, you know, pro bono. So, ten minutes after the plane left from Anchorage, Don Johns radioed the FAA flight station in Anchorage to file a flight plan. And this was not the first time Johns had talked to the FAA that day. 
He called earlier in the morning to get an update on the weather before the flight. He then notified the FAA specialists that he was going to fly Federal Airway Victor 317, which passes through Portage Pass and up to Yakutat, Alaska, and then he was slated to go to Juneau from Yakutat. Now, heading down Federal Airway Vector 317 doesn't really consist of flying an airway. Now, what does that necessarily mean? Well, it relies a lot on, a lot on sight of the pilot and following the terrain around you. Now, according to the National Transportation Safety Bureau, they stated in their final report on the terrain of area, and I quote, the mountainous terrain along the V317 airway between Anchorage and Yakutat is such that weather permitting, pilots of small aircraft preceding VFR, and VFR stands for visual flight rules. I'm gonna say VFR a lot, so just kind of keep that in your brain again. Along the route, as a general rule, fly in the southeastern direction from Anchorage over the Turnagain Arm of the Cook Inlet through Portage Pass over the Prince William Sound to Johnstone Point onto Yakutat, end quote. The NTSB then later goes on to say that the elevation of Portage Pass, or approximately 400 feet mean sea level, and that the mountains rise steeply on both sides between elevations of 3,000 to 6,000 feet mean sea level. Now, that's a lot of information all at once, and I'm going to probably bring it back to you as we later discuss kind of theories and everything about this. Now, back to the story. At 9.09 a.m., Don Johns filed his visual flight rules, like I mentioned, and the... FAA specialists recognized the voice as Don Johns. This was the same pilot who had asked for the weather report early in the morning. So we have the FAA specialist confirming that the voice he heard come back through at 9.09 was Don Johns, the pilot of the Cessna. Now, Don Johns stated that he, over the radio that he had departed Anchorage at 9 a.m. and his intended flight was that V317 airway and the estimated flight time was 3 hours and 30 minutes at an airspeed of 170 knots. Don Johns informed the specialist that four persons and fuel for six hours were on board. The specialist asked Johns if he had his emergency and locator beacon on board, and Johns replied affirmative. Now, who is this Don Johns? Now, by all accounts, Don Johns was an accomplished pilot. He would have been proficient at using the autopilot setting, but reports said this plane did not have autopilot, which means that the single pilot, Johns, would be obviously flying the stick the whole flight, which is not a problem, because obviously Johns was an experienced, plot, experienced pilot. So this wouldn't have been an issue, and according to Johns' writings, he wouldn't have hesitated to increase the altitude of the plane to avoid a possibility of strong turbulence in icy conditions, and he would have done so expertly, as, like I established, he was a very skilled pilot. Obviously, he had his own business, had numerous pilots underneath him. He was very skilled at what he did. So, that being said, there's a little background on Don Johns, right? So, now at 1.15 p.m., the U.S. Coast Guard Rescue Coordination Center, that's a mouthful, the U.S. Coast Guard Rescue Coordination Center at Juneau informed the U.S. Air Force RCC at Elmendorf Air Force Base that the Cessna with the congressman was overdue at Juneau. Now, the Air Force instantly conducted an extended communications check at 2.15 p.m. for any airfields that might have gotten a form of communications from the Cessna with the tailbox letters N1812H and turned up with zero luck. Nobody had gotten any radio communication from the Cessna. It was radio silence. Nobody had heard anything. The Air Force RCC then directed an airborne HC-130 to divert from its scheduled flight path and commence the search for N-1812H. Now, the search for N-1812H and Congressman Boggs and Begich was terminated on November 24th, 1972, Pretty sure they searched for 39 days. So much of this area had been covered multiple times by various U.S. Air Force, U.S. Army, U.S. Coast Guard, and the Civil Air Patrol. A total of 1,033 groups of troops 
involving 3,602 hours of flight time and a total area covered of 3,325,755 square miles. So that's a lot, obviously, and I don't need to go into detail about how that, that's a lot. And they spent a long time looking for these, for the congressmen, and they found nothing. They found absolutely nothing. So kind of put that in perspective for a little bit, a little bit of searching 325,000 square miles and finding absolutely nothing. Think about that for a second, because that's often crazy to believe. It's crazy for me to believe. Now, the weather that day was spotty at best, and some areas within the route of V317 looked better than others. Now, according to the NTSB's official report on the incident, they share a separate incident, incident within their official report on the disappearance of the Cessna about a U.S. Air Force helicopter that was coming from Elmendorf Air Force Base to Seward, Alaska, and this helicopter was over the Turnagain Arm, a spot that the Cessna N1812H was going to be using as a land marker when flying to Juneau, keep following me here, encountered heavy turbulence at 8.40 a.m. when it passed over this area. This helicopter was about seven miles from the village of Portage and Portage Pass when it encountered headwinds of 55 knots, which is about 63 miles an hour, overcast cloud coverage and deteriorating visibility, and because of this, hel because of this the helicopter abandoned its efforts to fly through Portage and took an alternate route. So obviously for a helicopter, 63 miles an hour wind gusts and very deteriorating visibility is not good. It's not good for any airplane. Um, so that kind of puts in perspective of the weather of that day that the Cessna was not driving through bluebird conditions by any means. Now, an interesting tidbit that was included in the NTSB's report is that the aviation area forecast for the area released at 8 a.m., and that showed that the weather conditions were going to be bad enough that Portage Pass was going to be closed until at least 2 p.m. because of weather conditions, as well as the clouds containing mild rime icing from 6,000 to 15,000 feet. Now, what is rime ice? This rime ice is ice that builds up from cloud coverage onto airplanes' wings. Now, an increase of rime ice on an airplane's wings can significantly reduce lift and increase drag. Now, this report that was published at 8 a.m. this morning, or 8 a.m. that morning, should not have varied a lot from the report Don Johns got in the morning when he called for a weather report. So Don Johns called for that weather report, I believe at 6.56 a.m., so about an hour before um, the weather stations in the area released their, their aviation report that morning. So that weather report still shouldn't have changed. It shouldn't have changed that much. They were pretty firm, okay, this is what the weather's going to be. It's not going to be great. This is what it is. It's not going to be great. So I'm not necessarily using that as an excuse for Don Johns. When he got his report earlier in the morning before the, before the, you know, the weather stations released their aviation report for that morning, it was, it was pretty much the same. So I'm not going to say that, oh, Don Johns got half of a report in terms of what the weather looked like. Because personally, I don't buy that. If the weather was consistent, the reports were consistent, hey, the weather's going to be kind of bad, that's just the way it is. So, but nonetheless, that's just me venting. Now, this report, like I said, shouldn't have varied. So did he still go through Portage Pass like his normal visual flight rules plan was? Now, obviously, like I just mentioned, Portage Pass was going to be closed until at least 2 p.m. Obviously, you can't say what a plane can and cannot do, but obviously when the weather station says, hey, you probably shouldn't fly through that area, the weather's going to be really, really bad. I don't know about you, but I wouldn't fly through that area because the weather's really, really bad. I mean, that just seems like common sense, right? But now, due to the flight regulations at this time, the Cessna was limited to flying strictly visual flight rules and not IFR, instrument flight rules, unless there were two pilots aboard, which there wasn't. 
So that means regardless, Johns was forced to fly visual flight rules through the less than ideal conditions that day. He could not use his instruments to fly because that was just flight regulations. Now, he's obviously on a plane that size. Okay, you have to use visual flight rules because you're the one flying. You don't have autopilot. You don't have instruments. You need to use VFR. So, a couple more important notes on top of the aircraft to add to this is that the airplane was not equipped with anti-icing equipment. It was not equipped with an allerg emergency locator transmitter, which at this time was not required by federal law but was required by Alaska state law. So because of this, Pan-Alaska pilots carried personal transmitter beacons to comply with state law. Now, if you remember the specialist asked over the phone when Johns was getting ready to fly with the congressman, he asked, do you have your emergency locator beacon on you? And Johns said affirmative. So kind of keep, again, there's a lot of things I'm asking you to keep in the back of your mind, but keep them in the back of your mind. Now, on this day the flight left, October 16, 1972, a witness who saw Johns that morning saw that he had an unidentified object in his briefcase that was the shape, size, but different, cover, different color than the emergency locating transmitters that Pan Alaska normally used. However, Don Johns' personal ELT was found after the plane was reported missing in the cabin of another Pan-Alaskan employees. Now, think about that for a second. Don Johns' personal ELT was found in the cabin of another Pan-Alaska employees. So that means, did Don, did Don Johns take a emergency locator transmitter onto that flight and I'll have an answer for that so obviously I'm, I'm, I'm telling you that but I already know the answer to it um, so after the NTSB did all these findings they concluded that and this was after their whole investigation one that there was no ELT on board whether it be built into the plane or a personal one Two, the plane was not also equipped with any of the necessary survival equipment it was supposed to. And three, the weather that day was not conclusive with VFR. So, if there was no ELT on board, what object did Don Johns bring onto the plane? If there was no ELT on board that plane, and a witness said that he brought something Brought, brought some sort of unidentified object in his briefcase that looked like an ELT, but obviously wasn't because the NTSB said that he there wasn't one on board. Because if there was one, odds are the plane would probably be located. So there's a lot of that to think about. Secondly, why was the plane not equipped with de-icing equipment? That I don't really have an answer to. Because it seems like if you're flying in an area like Alaska, you would probably want anti-icing equipment. Unless the plane is not fitted to fly at certain altitudes where the buildup of rime ice would hinder flight. But then again, Don John said in his personal writings that if he did encounter turbulence that day, he was not afraid to increase the altitude of the plane to get over the turbulence or around it. So if you increase your altitude, you're going to encounter the rime ice. So again, there's a lot of this that doesn't make a whole lot of sense on why, why, why John's even decided to fly that day with a congressman. It just doesn't make much sense at all. Now, the weather that day was not conclusive with the VFR like the NTSB said in their findings. Again, why did John's decide to take off that day? if the weather was not conclusive with VFR. Did he feel like he did not want to let the congressman down in any way? He wanted to make sure that they got to their, their destination in Juneau. He didn't want to let them down. He probably thought, oh, you know, I'm doing a favor for two U.S. congressmen. Maybe it's the whole idea that, okay, I pat their back, they'll pat mine. That could be it. But... Would you risk the lives on everybody on board to do that? 
probably not, or at least I probably wouldn't. But again, I don't know what's going through Don Johns' head when he gets ready to fly this plane, or when he, you know, loads everybody on board and, and decides to fly the plane. And the plane wasn't equipped with any survival equipment either, so if the plane, for example, crashed in the Alaskan wilderness, they didn't have any survival equipment. And I don't know what the weather that day specifically was, but it was October, so it was probably... Yeah, it probably wasn't warm by any means, but it probably wasn't, ex you know, like 20 below either. Um, but still, it being said, there was, no, there was no equipment on board. There was no survival equipment. So there's a lot of things that just don't make any sense between the no emergency, no ELT, even though Alaska state law said you had to have one, and John's lied about it. There was no survival equipment, no anti-icing equipment, which I'm pretty sure those two, that they weren't breaking the law when they decided to do no survival equipment and no anti-icing. I don't think that's against the law. The only thing that was against the law, or Alaska state law, was the, was the ELT. So, Johns deliberately broke Alaska law and lied to the specialist over the phone by saying, or over the radio, by saying, yeah, we have one, when in reality he didn't have one, which is weird because then, like I said, what did he bring on his briefcase into the plane to begin with? So, that being said, this kind of brings me into theories. And I know I said a lot of information all at once, and it was probably a lot to process, but I wanted to get into theories because there's three specific theories that I think that are important that could explain the disappearance of Congressman Boggs and Congressman Begich. Now, theory number one being, it was an accident. Now, this would conclude that the plane encountered heavy turbulence, maybe somewhere between Portage Pass and coming through somewhere within after Portage Pass, because obviously, I'm pretty sure they concluded that it didn't get through Portage Pass, or if it did, it didn't get through Portage Pass very far. Now, turn again arm, obviously I feel like they made it to turn again arm. But did they through, did they get through Portage Pass? Now, that's a big guy, I don't know. Obviously, the weather in the area for Portage Pass was very, very bad. So that would lead me to think that they didn't get through Portage Pass to begin with. So if they encountered heavy turbulence, buildups of ice, and they crashed their airplane in Portage Pass, that would pretty much say that, okay, it was a complete accident, and so on and so forth. However, they searched for... For the plane for 39 days. They searched for the plane for 39 days and they found absolutely nothing. So if it crashed in the wilderness, that doesn't make a whole lot of sense. But then yet again, Portage Pass is kind of an area that is not very easily searchable. And that's only because it is extremely mountainous. It's pretty much glacial a huge glacier in between Portage Pass. You have the mountains on both sides. It's very, very... It's a difficult area to traverse, obviously. So, if the plane did not crash in Portage Pass, and it crashed in, for example, the ocean afterwards, you wouldn't... You, I... I feel like it'd be hard to find it, obviously, without a ELT or emergency transmitter. Now, do I like the accident theory? Yes, I do like the accident theory, but the conspiracy theorist in me leans to these two other theories, and then I will kind of bring it all together at the end and kind of explain what I fully believe in. Now, theory number two. It was a bomb that, blot, that brought down the plane. Now, the FBI did a limited probe into this theory that it was a bomb that brought down the Cessna containing Congressman Boggs and Congressman Begich. 
they did a probe into this theory into the 1990s, and it actually led them to somebody. It led them to Jerry Max Paisley, who was a low-level mob figure who was serving a life sentence in Arizona for unrelated bombings and even a murder. Now, Jerry Max Paisley told investigators about a supposed plot to blow up the plane. Now, here is the interesting thing. Shortly after the plane disappeared, I believe it was 17 months? Don't quote me on that. Don't quote me on that. I'm pretty sure the article that I read said 17 months. Jerry Max Paisley actually married Peggy Begich, Nick Begich's late wife, after this event. So Nick Begich, quote-unquote, dies from the plane crash. And this Jerry Max Paisley, many months later, married his ex-wife, which is kind of interesting. (laughs) Paisley came forward with all this after he was arrested in Tucson, Arizona, for murder. And obviously Jerry Max Paisley knew that he wasn't getting out anytime soon, so he decided to come clean to the government about murdering Nick Begich. And in this theory... The plot was not to kill Congressman Boggs. Congressman Boggs was not the primary target. It was actually Begich. Now, a mafia boss in the Joe Bonanno Sr. crime family... So this was not Joe Bonanno Sr. This was a mafia boss, a lieutenant in this mafia family, ordered Jerry Max Paisley to plant the bomb on the plane. And then afterwards, after, you know, plane blew up, Jerry Max Paisley actually moved to Anchorage and developed a relationship and later married, like I said, Peggy Begich, who he had met before through mutual friends. Now, if Jerry Max Paisley went to Anchorage and placed the bomb on the plane, blew up the plane, and the target was Nick Begich, I don't know necessarily why the target was Nick Begich to begin with, unless there was some sort of conspiracy to... You know, like, oh, you know, you should kill my... Or Peggy Begich was like, oh, you should kill my husband and be with me instead. Like, I can't really buy that, you know, because I feel like there's a lot easier... This is going to sound really kind of morbid, but why would you blow up a plane? You work for the mafia. If you blew up the plane to try and kill Congressman Begich because you wanted to be with his wife, why? Why? You know what I mean? You work for the mafia. Do you feel like if you did do that, it would basically put a target on your mafia family and therefore would come back to you? Maybe. But this is all just me speculating, of course. I have no idea what I'm talking about. I'm just regurgitating information that I feel like could be possibly true. So there's there's this theory that Jerry Max Paisley went to Anchorage, placed a bomb on the plane, and blew it up. But that being said, there still has been no debris found of the airplane in 50 years. Supposedly, there's been no no wreckage found of the airplane in 50 years. So if it was a bomb, and they exploded it, they exploded the plane, and it exploded into 300 pieces, you would think that somebody would find a piece that would match an 1812H in Cessna. But there hasn't been. So do I buy the bomb theory? I I don't know. So that brings us to the third theory. That this was an assassination. Not against Begich, but against Congressman Boggs. Now, why Congressman Boggs? Now, like I said earlier, Boggs was a member of the Warren Commission. Now, Boggs, during the Warren Commission, agreed with the committee's findings that Lee Harvey Oswald acted alone when he killed JFK. Now, that being said, Boggs wasn't, reportedly wasn't fully happy with these findings and said that he wanted to reopen the JFK investigation. Now, if you've done any investigation into the conspiracies that surround the JFK assassination which I think everybody has heard some sort of conspiracy theory about JFK's assassination. I think everybody's heard at least one, if not two. Somebody kind of has an idea that like, oh, you know, it was Lee Harvey Oswald, but a lot of people think the government killed him. I'm not going to go into detail about that because I don't want black suburbans following me wherever I go. Um, 
which it gets a chuckle out of me, but nonetheless. Um, Boggs came forward and spoke of an incident in which a Lincoln Continental ran his car off the road in July of 1970, and Hale Boggs af actually chased after the car and wrote down the license plate and contacted D.C. Metro Police. Now, the D.C. Metro Police said, hey, no record of this car exists, and when you try and contact the D.C. Metro Police to say, hey, what happened with this incident with Congressman Hale Boggs in 1970 where his car was ran off the road? The D.C. Metro Police will deny that this incident took place and they have absolutely no records or reports that it happened. So again, think about that for a second. Now, Hale Boggs was also convinced that the FBI was wiretapping his phones and said that on multiple occasions publicly. And Hale Boggs even later called for the resignation of then-FBI Director J. Edgar Hoover. So again... Hale Boggs wasn't a big fan of the FBI for a couple different reasons. And if we know anything about the FBI and the history of the FBI's uh, maybe sometimes questionable, questionable practices and methods. Yeah, so just th think about that theory for a second. So, what's, what's my theory in all of this? Now... I went pretty deep into it, and I, and I found a lot of information, and obviously these three separate theories between, you know, it was an accident, it was a bomb that was intended to kill Nick Begich, or it was an assassination against Hale Boggs. I still think, because of the, the weather that day, I'm still leaning towards it was an accident. And I think I'm going to buy the accident theory. I'm going to buy into the accident theory. Not because I don't think that there's any information to support the other two, because I think there is. To me, the weather that day alludes to me to say that it was an accident. I think that Don Johns felt, I don't know if he felt pressured or how he felt to get the congressman where they needed to go on time. He felt like he could risk it. He felt like he could fly through rough weather. He felt like he could, he could do it just because he wanted to make sure that he did not let the congressman down, because like I said, he was doing this, he wasn't getting paid to do this flight. So, was he pretty much saying that, okay, I just want to make sure that they get on time, that obviously, again, like I mentioned before, the whole, you know, you pat my back, I pat yours, you know, could that have been going through his head? I think more than likely it was. And I think that, Don Johns felt like he could go through it. He felt like he was a skilled enough pilot. He thought that he could uh, get around any adverse weather or he didn't think that the weather was going to be that bad. But more likely than not, I think that if the Cessna got through Portage Pass, the weather was bad enough to where he maybe have crashed into the ocean. To me, that makes only... That makes the most sense because if... The plane crashed in the wilderness. I feel like something would be found now. Something would have been found. But there's nothing that's been found. So to me, that makes sense. And obviously, there was no contact with any radio stations or communication towers or whatever you may be from the plane. So if... That means that the plane obviously didn't get very far from Anchorage. So if the plane got through Portage Pass but didn't make it any farther than Portage Pass encountered severe turbulence in and around Portage Pass in general, something happened, systems failed, and it crashed into the ocean. And obviously there was no survival equipment on board of this plane, and there was no ELT, so the plane couldn't have been found. To me, that's what I buy. I buy that it was an accident, Don Johns felt like he could risk it, and when he felt like he could risk it, it got all four on board killed. Now, obviously, we kind of know, obviously, all four of these individuals are obviously passed away because that's the only outcome in the situation that makes any sense, which honestly makes the incident sad in general. But to me, what drew me to this incident is that not a lot of people knew about this. Not a lot of people know about this. Um, and it's been, since 1972, it's been, it's been 50 years since this took place, and not a lot of people even knew that it took place. So, 
it was a very cool one to research and it was kind of cool to to learn a little bit about the kind of aviation stuff and you know me reading through the ntsb's official report and everything and and even the fbi report on it and um i did a lot of digging into it and it was cool to research and like i said my theory is that this was strictly an accident the system most likely crashed into the ocean due to bad weather and that's why they can't find the plane is that the lame theory yeah sure it's the lame theory for everybody who's uh, uh, you know, a diehard conspiracy theorist. Sure, that's a lame theory, but it makes the most sense, in my opinion. It makes the most sense of everything that, that, that happened, regardless of, you know, Hale Boggs' relationship with the FBI or everything like that. To me, what makes the most sense is that it was an accident and the plane probably crashed into the ocean only because it's been 50 years and they have not found a single piece of the plane. So, that's the theory I'm going to buy. Um, and that kind of concludes today's episode. I hope you enjoyed it. Obviously, this is going to drop on a Wednesday instead of a Tuesday, and I do apologize about that. Time kind of got away from me this week. And I hope you all enjoyed this episode. Like I said, um, I hope the delay was worth it. Like I said, I had a whole lot of fun researching this episode, and I hope all of you folks take something away from it and learn a little bit more about kind of this situation that happened over 50 years ago that nobody has really heard about. So that being said... I want to thank you for turn, tuning into this week's episode of Unblurring the Unknown, and I will see you on the next one.